Today, we're adding to our Better Business Partnering series by talking about how the CFO can work more closely with the Chief Revenue Officer. Both leaders play a key role in managing the company's financial health and rely on each other to make the best strategic decisions they can for their business. Joining me to discuss this topic is Puneet Arora, president of Yellow.ai. Puneet has been a CRO and has over 25 years experience leading sales teams and revenue operations. He's been involved in high growth SaaS companies such as Salesforce, Oracle, and D2L. Puneet, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Melissa. You've had many years experience with different sales organizations. You've been a CRO before, and you've recently taken on a new and exciting opportunity. Can you tell us a little bit about your new role? Absolutely. So I joined uh, a company called Yellow.ai uh, just under two, two months ago. So I'm in week seven, still in the, in the honeymoon period. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Yellow.ai, uh, we deliver true Gen AI-led customer conversations. So think about, uh, you know, for example, in customer service, uh, as customers connect over multiple different uh, modalities, such as chat or voice, or, or SMS, social, email, how do you serve them with a human-like transaction, with a human-like conversation um, and allow them to, to, to be, be served and be transacted as humans without actually connecting with the human. So how do you deflect calls that go into your contact center? How do you serve those customers when they come to your website and they have questions about a service, et cetera? So that's what we do. And you know, our, our uh, company started off in India. Uh, we moved into, into the APAC region. And then from there, about two years ago into, into North America and EMEA. Got about 1,200 customers globally, power about 16-ish billion conversations annually, uh, all, through, all through AI and available in about 130 languages. So I took on the role as, as president uh, and I lead all go-to-market. So uh, go-to-market field operations, meaning sales, marketing, support, uh, customer success, professional services, and all operations for go-to-market. So anything outside of GNA, uh, engineering, uh, and product. When you talk about go-to-market, it's interesting because not every company has the role of CMO and CRO separate. Sometimes they're together. You see different org structures. Let's start with just defining when you think about what the role of the CRO is, what do you think? The CRO role has evolved over, over time and it's got it has been looked at in multiple facets. You know, in some places, some companies CRO own sales. Uh, what I'm seeing today in more modern organizations, CRO owns, you know, go to market. So if I look at what a CRO's job is, you know, CRO's job is to maximize revenue building and customer value strategies and align those to the company's financial goals. That's what a CRO does in essence. And that's usually measured, you know, in, in multiple ways. One, in bookings, the sales side of things. In churn, sometimes the customer success side of things. And then in overall revenue growth of an organization. So that's what, in my opinion, you know, a CRO does in essence. And as I look at, you know, how a CRO, the role a CRO plays in the overall growth of a company, and in owning GTM, I kind of look of it, look at it as as three legs to to a stool. GTM as three legs to a stool. You know, you've got sales, you've got marketing, and you've got product. Any one of those legs falls, that stool will break. That's go to market, and finance sitting on the top of it, making sure that we're operating at the levers that we need to with the holistic, you know, holistic customers, uh, financial model and plan. When I picture finance sitting on top of the stool, hopefully it's uh, not breaking that stool. So we're going to get into a little bit about how we how we work well together. You've worked alongside many CFOs in your experience. From your perspective, why is it so important for the office of the CFO and the CRO to work closely together? The CFO and CROs have to be 
connected and the understanding of the business uh, jointly is absolutely critical. You know, I look at it and say, if I look at an equation, you know, there are two sides to an equation, right? The first side is really understanding what triggers make a business run, right? This is the 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 CRO side. Uh, am I an enterprise focused organization? Am I a velocity focused organization? Are we direct? Are we indirect? Are we international? Are we in multiple countries or one country? Are we bringing new products to market or are we uh, land and expand kind of a, a, a go-to-market strategy. That's what the CRO leads, this side of the equation. And, you know, the, obviously the CFO needs to understand that for that strategy to be to be executed. And on the other end of the equation is the, the financial side uh, of the business you know how do you how do you measure productivity how do you align to corporate goals uh, are we do we have the right business metrics are we driving the light uh, the right uh, top line and the right bottom line with the right margins in place that's the side that the CFO manages so to me the CFO and the CRO need to be aligned for that equation uh, to form. And that's what I think, you know, overall go to market is, is those different parts of the organization coming together and, and finance kind of sitting on top and managing, uh, managing uh, those fundamentals. In your new role, you're responsible for driving revenue and overall go to market. How have you prioritized the relationship building with the CFO? I know it's only been seven weeks. It's been seven weeks. And I think in those seven weeks, uh, I've spent three weeks across three different countries with with our CFO. So my first week, uh, we were at uh, the international uh, sales kickoff uh, in Thailand. Um, uh, second week in the U.S. together, and in the third week in in, in Mexico together for the uh, North American sales kickoff. But it was important to 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 connect uh, with the CFO and and kind of build you know. To do two things. A, build that personal relationship. We're going to work together for a long time. We've got to get to know each other. But then B, to really have a common understanding of the business. As I was getting uh, onboarded, uh, I, I had the you know opportunity to look at the business from different aspects because we were meeting with the uh, international team, the North American team in different locations, uh, got to meet customers in multiple locations, etc. Uh, it was a great avenue or a great opportunity for the CFO to join me in those uh, meetings as well. So we both got to see uh, how the business was conducted um, at the ground level, understand some of the, the metrics by which the business needs to be conducted, you know, understand financial goals, understand direction, understand the, the impact of, 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 of some of the, the, the go-to-market strategies, strategies we have to the financial model. So that allowed us in the first uh, seven weeks, uh, three weeks for us to be together. So we didn't, both of us make a very conscious effort to get aligned. It sounds like you had a great opportunity to just jump in with both feet mm -hmm. there and, and really forge a strong relationship from the beginning, which is terrific. Now, when you reflect then on roles that you've had prior to the current role, I'm imagining you've had various roles or various relationships with the finance departments at the different companies you've been with. How much did you prioritize those relationships and, and how has that evolved over time? I'll say it again, the, the, the role and the connection between the CRO and the CFO is paramount. And um, I'll, I'll break it down, Melissa, in, with two distinct examples, uh, both public companies, so I, I, won't, I won't mention names. But, you know, the first I'll talk about was a growth-focused company, uh, had a great relationship with the CFO. You know, we were, we were, we were, uh, uh, this is when we were, we were private with we a great relationship. We would, we would connect and uh, make sure we were aligned for, on key metrics and aligned for board meetings, uh, both part of the exec team, very well aligned. Um, and then there was a couple of metrics that changed. One was uh, we went through uh, uh, public listings, so we became a, a publicly traded company. And the other was based on industry dynamics. We had to move to balanced growth. Many people today are aware of, of what that is. And I really saw, you know, our relationship, uh, myself and the, and the CFO, really grow because we needed to really understand 
what each other was doing and how they were doing it. The way a public company works versus the way a private company works and how you're measured and how you report are very, very different. Um, you know, we, we would try different experiments as we changed from a grow at all costs to a, to a balanced uh, growth model. We had to try different things. Like we call them experiments. Do we enter new countries? Do we open in new segments? Do we try new business models? So we had to be aligned to understand what those took and 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 where it was working and where it wasn't. If it was working, great, let's continue. If it was not working, how do we reset and, and quickly alter? So I really saw our relationship grow uh, because we had to be tied by, at the hip because we had to trust each other and more importantly, had to know what each other was doing and what the impact had to the overall business. In contrast, you know, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you um, uh, a different scenario as uh, another company uh, where we had profitable growth for many, many quarters. And it always felt like, you know, there was no investment um, in the growth side it was more just say, how do we drive more into the bottom line? And company was part of that. The market was not as much. We were not getting the appreciation in the in the in the uh, stock gains um, because others were focused on growth and we were focused more on you know on EBITDA with with some growth. And it almost felt like that relationship, while a very cordial one, was one that was always about justification. Why do I need this? Why this is important? And it always felt like uh, any time I was in uh, chatting with the CFO, and once again, a very cordial relationship, but it was always about, hey, I need this, and this is why, and this is what it will do, and okay, we'll give it to you, and you know, want to see the return right away. We weren't able to do different things. We weren't able to, to try different things. So two very different examples, one in which the synergy was there, and one in which I wouldn't say the synergy wasn't there, but the, the alignment uh, to where revenue organization wanted to go and where the uh, financial organization wanted to go were very, very different. What's interesting about those examples that you you just gave is that things change at different times in the life of a company. And that alignment is really crucial so that you can together get through the change management whatever way it's going for the business, because you're right, sometimes it's more about growth, in which case it often feels the CRO is more driving things forward and is really the top customer in the organization. And I would say that's always the case in any organization where, you know, sales and product have to be who others are there try helping to service. But Depending where you're focusing for the business, sometimes that can change and maybe it's a little bit less of the focus and there's other things. And being on the same page, knowing why you're doing what you're doing and how you're going to get there so that you can not only walk hand in hand, but also get the rest of the business to come with you in supporting that, I absolutely think is a critical piece of that. Absolutely. When you step back now and you think about the landscape today, what do you see as some of the top challenges that CROs are facing? We've gone through a lot of change over the last few years um, in business models and in valuations and obviously the, 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 the financial and, and uh, you know, also just the, the work environment per se. I, I see a few things that, that CROs, uh, challenges CROs face. I think the first is needing to do a lot more with less. We've got to go ahead and drive higher bookings uh, with less, uh, you know, resources. Let that be either feet on the street or or marketing spend. Um, you know, you've you've just got to do a lot more uh, than what has previously been available. You know, investors, either public investors or or private investors, they want to see growth. But now they want to see balanced growth, which means you've got to you've got to manage that equation uh, very very well, and that's that that's a new challenge I think many CROs face. Um, I think another one is kind of doing that, just building on that, is doing that, but through multimodal selling. What I mean by that is, you've got to be able to do it in a remote environment, 
Some places you might be hybrid, some places you might be in the office. So how do you do more when you have this constraint? You might have a constraint of trying to sell into SMB and wanting to move up market into mid market and move up market more into enterprise or vice versa. Very different ways of selling. So how do you try these new approaches? How do you get to these new approaches when you're in some, in some cases uh, you know, cash constraint or, or cost constraint? Uh, and then, you know, trying to manage these new types of go-to-market models, if I may. We always had sales-led uh, models. Then we had product-led sales. Now we have community-led selling. So you've got these different selling styles that you've got to uh, work with across multiple different selling uh, modalities of selling across, you know, different ways in which you sell. So to me, Bringing all of this together just creates a lot of noise in the organization because you've got to figure out the strategy that works with you. It works for the, for the company and then, and then obviously uh, that aligns to the financial model of the company. But to me, that's the, the, the problems that CROs face today is how do we take what's needed, distill that into the right strategy and then get the company aligned as you were saying earlier to go and execute on that. How do you think that finance teams can best help CROs to work around some of these challenges? That's where I think the alignment uh, between uh, go-to-market or the CRO and, and, and finance, uh, the, the, the CFO, are absolutely critical. And if I were to kind of you know, sum it up, I think it's really understanding the nuance of the go-to-market strategy. It's very easy to, to say, well, this is the spend we have, go build a strategy. But what's more important is really understanding how and why that strategy is going to be efficient. And that's where the finance team, to your question, Melissa, the finance team and the CRO have to work very, very closely together. So really understanding, you know, are we, uh, for example, a new product sell or are we a land and expand? Uh, because that strategy is very, very different, right? Are we an enterprise sales model? That takes a lot longer for deals to close than does a velocity SMB or mid-market approach. The cost models are very, very different. If you're going direct versus indirect, customer acquisition costs are very, very different. And lead times are very, very different. So really understanding what that nuance of that go-to-market strategy is, I think is very important for the finance organization to get involved with and really, really comprehend. And the way I would say to do that, you know, is um, getting on calls. Uh, one of the things I saw with CFOs that I've respected in the past um, and, and current CFO I respect is them getting on calls with us. Understand the sales notion, right? If if uh, I, I I always joke and say, you know, if a, if a CRO is expected to know the balance sheet and know the financial statements, the CFO should know the playbook. Jumping in on calls and understanding the different selling notions, understanding the different types of customers, and then relating that back to the financial metrics that the company needs to be run on. It's funny you say that. We've said it in the past and had guests on the show as well who said that the CFO actually needs to be one of the number one salespeople in the organization in that they know the story, who you're selling to, why, how, all those pieces, because that's so critically important to being able to pull things together. You know, you and I have worked together before. And one of the things I think that you also do that helps make it easy for a finance team to work together and, and keep that alignment is you take the time to explain what's happening and create that empathy about what it's like to be in the shoes of the salesperson and what are some of those objections they're feeling or the things that are at the current time hard about the job so that you can put your heads together to figure out what are we going to do through this. And sometimes whether that's, hey, maybe we need to invest over here, which may be another part of the business that's not even directly in sales, but it's going to help in support of advancing things. And that, I think that's something that I've always found very helpful is you helping the business also to understand what you're seeing because you're talking to customers all the time. You know what's working, what's hard, maybe where we need more support in the business. And so that 
open communication, I think, is is super helpful. Yeah, and you know, I appreciate you saying that, Melissa. And um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's also being selfish because if 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 the rest of the org doesn't know what problems or 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 where the roadblocks are, then those roadblocks will never go away, or we'll never be able to to try and solve for them. So. Uh, I, you know, it's it's that alignment across the various, I call them the various legs of the stool uh, that are needed um, across the entire go-to-market. And once that's there, that go-to-market can become a lot more effective. So I appreciate you saying that. Let's talk for a minute about revenue ops or go-to-market ops, yeah. call different things in different organizations. I think sometimes finance teams, as they think about how to best partner with different parts of the business, they're not always sure how to work with revenue ops and where the lines should be and who should be doing what or how they can best complement each other. What are your experiences there? Rev ops, um, you know, used to be called sales ops, uh, and then from there, marketing ops, and now you have customer success ops, support ops. Uh, but the overall notion of revenue operations, possibly in my, in, from my perspective, is the closest in bringing that alignment into action. So once that alignment is there in the model, this is what we're going to go. We're going to focus on these areas. We're going to go it with this kind of a, a, a notion. This is the spend we can provide. Then revenue operations comes in and says, great, let us go and execute on this. So this is then bringing in the right uh, you know, commission plan, bringing in the right metrics that you want to measure, looking at certain models and fine tuning them as you as you progress through that that go to market journey. So to me, revenue operations, which is becoming even more critical today as we don't have enough time or we, we, the amount of time needed to make change is becoming less and less and less. Revenue operations is becoming that glue that really allows for strategy and then the operational side to come together. So uh, I couldn't agree with you more. RevOps is becoming that fundamental layer, which is allowing finance, that strategy, go to market, that execution to come together. Yeah, I love the way that you summarize that in terms of the the execution arm, because there's another stool that forms there when you think about how you bring together the operations team with the CRO and with their finance business partner to make sure that things are going or if we see things, maybe there's something that should be being flagged in the metrics, but that they really do all know their part and are staying very connected so that things are are running according to the plan that you have and you're carrying out the strategy that's been agreed on. Well, you're right. When, we, we, you know, when you look at it, I almost think of it as, you know, you have the, the, the uh, CFO and the CRO who set the strategy and, the, and, and how it's to be executed. And then you have uh, the finance business partner, a very critical role uh, paired with, um, you know, revenue operations. And they are going in and executing on that, looking at the metrics day in and day out. Are we hitting, you know, the magic number? Okay, if we have to hit that, how are we getting to that? Or if we're, if we're not hitting that well, do we need to augment uh, our spend or is it the, the actual s- structure of, for example, the comp plan that isn't right? Uh, those are very different strategies that could both drive to the same uh, type of result. But that's where, that's where you're right, Melissa, the, the financial business partner and um, RevOps have to be very, very aligned. As a longtime CRO and revenue ops leader, Do you have any advice for CFOs who are working with a CRO for the first time or looking for ways that they can strengthen their relationship? Get on calls. Join, join the, the, um, uh, the sales team uh, on calls and try and understand from uh, customers what problems they're facing, how they plan to solve them. What are some of their constraints? Uh, you know, the, the, the usual thought is, hey, a sales leader or sales teams, all they want to do is, is um, uh, maximize their paychecks. But I've really seen, you know, true leaders, uh, CROs or sales leaders are more involved and more reliant on the long-term strategy of the company. 
And for that, I'd say, you know, getting in on deals, really understanding what customers are seeing, um, where the roadblocks are, I think is, is, is one of the most critical things a new CFO or, or uh, CFO trying to bridge or make that relationship with, uh, with a CRO uh, should be. Yeah, you sometimes hear the term that sales is coin operated, which yeah. I, I think, you know, for a finance person, it it can be hard to hear. But but that's an aspect of it, because often a really large portion of the compensation of these individuals is also tied up in these results. Right. So there, it does lend itself to some of that behavior. What have you seen as some of the biggest friction points between the office of the CRO and office of finance? I think some of the biggest friction points uh, usually end up when compensation models are not aligned. I'll, I'll, I'll say two things. Compensation models or overall goals are not aligned. Sales team might be trying to drive for something. It could be, you know, we just need to get a ton of new logos. Might be, for example, at a lower cost. Just get more logos in and then we can land and expand. But the, the, the model does not allow for that. Because we're being measured on just maybe pure ARR. And in land and expand, that might take a little bit of while for that ARR to build. So that would equate to, to friction. So... When I have no, I've noticed when the compensation plan is not aligned to the outcomes that drive the financial plan, that's when you have conflicts. That's a really good one. What about when it comes to how these functions can work together on pricing deal desks, some of those areas where I think sometimes friction can come in when it comes down to actually trying to get deals done? What are your thoughts on that? I do think, you know, the deal desk actually should be in finance because at the end of the day, they are the, the gatekeepers of the, of the, of the, uh, and making sure that the, the contract coming in is going to be effective for the company and is going to drive the results that uh, the company needs. So I do think that role should sit in finance. I've seen it sit multiple places. I've seen it sit in the, in the CRO's organization. I've seen it sit uh, in, in, in finance. I think it should sit in finance. But, you know, that's where, where I've seen it be successful. It's somebody, again, who knows and understands the, the, the compensation model and can come in and say, hey, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to increase um, year one because maybe we pay on year one uh, ARR. Well, we would prefer to get a multi-year deal. So how do we, because that's what maybe the business might want, right? We want longer term predictable revenue. How do we drive to that versus just uh, on the compensation side? I think that's where deal that really comes in and can help minimize that individual uh, deal structure, not let it be just for the individual salesperson, but more aligned uh, for the organization and the company. And one of the things that I've seen work well there is when you do have that centralized deal desk, they're often working then across so many different salespeople. They see a lot of things even across the CRO's organization to bring that insight forward and say, hey, I'm seeing this is coming up really often, or I'm seeing that this play seems to be successful when sales does this to help inform and, and keep improving what your processes are, or maybe changing what the guardrails look like to make sure that they match, because you don't want this to become inefficient where it's everything has to come for an exception and maybe it'll be yes, maybe no. You want to, you, you really want to find, you know, the things that you really need to be stuck in on, those should be coming up as exceptions, but but I think sometimes it requires a bit of flexibility as you go to adjust to what's happening. Absolutely. You, you, you've got to be able to adjust and then you've got to be able to drive to what that strategy is. And I'll give you, Melissa, uh, um, um, an anecdote here. Um, at, at a prior company, uh, you know, we had, as we did our president's club, uh, we would have the, the friend of sales. And the friend of sales was somebody who across all the sales leaders uh, was the most highly 
regarded person in helping them achieve uh, their uh, metrics, meaning you know, their bookings numbers and, and you know, getting over plan and over quota. And in two of the biggest years we had, both those times, that person was the head of deal desk and came out of the finance organization because that person understood the nuance of each individual deal, what was happening, why it was being done that way, and then would go back and say, hey, we need to change the comp plan because X, Y, Z does not make sense. It's, this is the friction it's driving in the way it's structured today. And that person became the closest to the sales organization uh, because they were able to effectively create a frictionless uh, you know, compensation structure, which aligned very well to the financial goals of the company. Now that's what good partnership looks like for sure. Absolutely. Now, if you were to reflect on the different finance teams you've worked with, a number of different CFOs through your career, what would you say are some of the biggest strengths that they had? The ability to listen, ability to be open-minded and understand that strategies change. Not every customer is the same. You know, Melissa, as we work together, I like to use, you know, funny, uh, silly, silly anecdotes. I'll say one here, you know, as a father of two, uh, you know, both have shared the same DNA, but I promise you they're very, very different kids. My, <laughs> my nine-year-old boy and my 15-year-old girl are very, very different human beings. Um, same thing I would say uh, in our world of selling. No two deals are usually the exact same. There's always that intricacies. So being able to listen, being able to understand and, and being able to, you know, filter out and go to the lowest common denominator and say, this is the metric we want to drive. And here are the trends that we want to. So let's go and work on that either through spend or through compensation plans or through different incentives or, or how we structure different organizations, et cetera. That quality uh, in, a, in, in, a, in, in finance and in the CFO is what makes it easiest to work with. Puneet, what is the one thing that you would want finance folks to know that you think they may not know about the office of the CRO? Yes, uh, revenue folks, we are coin operated. No questions asked. Um, you know, quarter comes, quarter goes. We very quick to forget uh, the bad quarter and really jump in on, on the new quarter. We'll always promise, oh yeah, yeah that deal is going to, oh, it, it will deliver a lot more next, next year or next month or, <laughs> you know, uh, at the next renewal cycle. But the one thing I will say, at the end of the day, most good sales leaders, most good CROs are less interested in that one paycheck and are really interested in the long-term viability of a company. How can I build an annuity model for a lack of better words? How can we drive to that long-term success? So my, my, my only ask would be, you know, look past that end of quarter, we need to close this deal, we need to close this deal, and really start thinking about how do you build that long-term long model, um, which, if I look at good CROs, that's what they really want. Although the fun of that pressure at quarter end is pretty neat. It's, it's just, it's so great, right? Who, who'd want to miss that? Absolutely. <laughs> so Puneet, can you think of an example where because you work together closely with your finance team, it resulted in better outcomes for your business? Absolutely. Uh, Melissa, I think this will bring back some memories. This is with us, uh, with us working together. You know, I, I, I fondly remember uh, there was a situation where um, when we had customers uh, in, in proof of concepts, our win rates were very, very low just because the product was so diverse, so deep. Uh, you know, it was it required quite a bit to do in order to, to, to get configured. Um, you and I sat down and said, we've got to go change this. And as we looked at that, uh, it was multiple things. It was it was change in organizational alignment. It was adding more expense because we were taking on support for for all those POCs. There were added expenses because of uh, hosting, um, you know, costs that were coming up. And I remember us sitting down and saying, "Okay, we know we got to do this. 
These are the different things we got to go change. Now, where do we go find those expenses? Because we had a fixed budget. And uh, we went through, we, we, we looked at roles within, within my organization, within the entire company, and we came up with a cost structure that would support this. And uh, we made those changes. We monitored it very closely because we knew the impact it would have. And I still remember when multiple quarters after we took win rates up to 50% plus and, you know, saw the, saw the fruit uh, that the tree started to bear. So that one brings, uh, brings a fond memory uh, to me of how uh, closely uh, office of the CFO and office of the CRO work together and drive results that, that, uh, that deliver value. I remember that one as well, Puneet, and it was absolutely great to get to work together. And, and I think that coming out of that by us working together on situations like that, what it did is it starts to create a continuation of coming together when there's a challenge. And I, I know I would certainly come to you often. We became confidants of one another where we would bounce things, bounce ideas off of each other quite regularly just to check our thinking or if there was a challenge, put our heads together. And uh, absolutely, I think it can have amazing impacts for the business and personally too, makes it a lot more fun. I certainly enjoyed, you know, working together with you. So that, thank you for sharing that one. No, absolutely. And I completely agree with you, you know, when that trust is created, that uh, that you know we're there to solve a common goal and we're open to moving um, whatever elements we needed to get to that goal, and and we did that collectively. And it wasn't your way or my way; it was whatever was the right way of doing this. Once that trust was created, Melissa, you know it was. I think we could we we could. F- we could go and do anything. We got closer together as as friends and as, as colleagues. And you're right, we ran things across our organizations, things uh, in other organizations by each other. And you know that's what uh, that's what uh, working closely is all about. So, Puneet, thank you so much for being on the show today, sharing your advice. Now, whenever we have a guest on the show, we do have two rapid fire questions that we like to ask. So, are you ready? I absolutely am. What is the best piece of business or leadership advice that you've ever received? I'll never forget this. I, I was in, in uh, making a suggestion on what to do uh, for, uh, for a line of business. And my CEO asked me, do you know this or are you assuming this? And I said, no, 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 I know this because the, the, the numbers are showing this. And, and he said, no, you do not know this. You're assuming this. So his advice to me was, You know, don't make business decisions based on Excel spreadsheets. Uh, Go in, get into the field, understand all the metrics that are driving the the decision, and then understand what works, what doesn't work for the business. Once you do that, your decisions will be a lot more accurate. So since that day, Yes, we make decisions all the time, but I try to augment that as much as I can with real field in the in the trenches uh, experience, talking to people, visiting customers, understanding why they're successful, why they're not. To me, that's what was one lesson I learned um, from a, from a very well respected CEO. Interesting advice. So those Excel spreadsheets, though, Puni, just to be clear, they still have a place in that, right? Absolutely. You're not saying do with them. Absolutely. They absolutely have a place. Look, at the end of the day, numbers never lie. Uh, but <laughs> but vetting that out and, and, and providing that real uh, in the trenches perspective augments that and makes those decisions much, much easier and much more effective to make. So second question, what is something that you do in your personal life that helps you show up as your best self in your work life? Yeah, this is something, um, you know, uh, I've, I've, I've enjoyed for the last uh, many years being a West Coaster and uh, having worked for, for, for East Coast companies taught me to kind of get up early and try and get ahead of the game, you know. There's nothing better than coming in into a day and you're done with your slacks. You're done with some of the priority emails. You've looked at your dashboards and you know what happened yesterday. You've maybe asked a few questions. That then opens up 
the first part of the day to go and make decisions and go and drive key conversations, whatever those are. So what 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 I've learned to do is 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 get up early. Some days I'm up, you know, as early as four thirty in the morning. Sleep late, uh, sleep, sorry, sleep early, get up early, um, and then from there just structure the day to where, when you start, you 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 understood what has happened in the past. You know what you got to do earlier in the day, make those decisions, have those meetings, and the rest of the day, you're just following up and cleaning out inboxes, things like that. That's something that I've done now uh, for uh, over a decade, and I wouldn't change it uh, in any other way. Well, and they say it's important to know what your peak performance is for making decisions, and Mm -hmm. it sounds like for you, it's the morning, so it sounds like a good match. Eight, Eight to 11 a.m. in the morning. Puneet, thank you so much for joining me today. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much, Malisha. It, it was a pleasure uh, connecting again and being a part, uh, part of this with you. If you would like more information about today's topic, please visit the links in the show notes. And if you like what you heard today, please leave us a review on any of the streaming platforms. We always like to hear from you and it helps other listeners to find the show. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to or watch your podcasts because you don't want to miss an episode. For The CFO Show, I'm your host, Melissa Howitson. Until next time.